Hi, this is Wukash from HDB and you're watching the second episode of Import Async I.O., an introduction to the Python framework enabling asynchronous single-threaded concurrent code using coroutines. Before we dig in, let me thank you for the very warm welcome this series already received after just one episode. I'm frankly a little terrified whether I'll be able to deliver on the very high expectations you seem to be having for this particular series. In this series, we're trying to um, teach you, to show you AsyncIO as an incrementally um, teachable, incrementally understandable concept, something that you can use to write applications that will support tens of thousands of concurrent customers with no problem. In fact, this is done very often for this particular framework. So, this series is um, split into eight parts. I always felt like a single conference talk was not enough to cover AsyncIO in good detail. So we're gonna go and make eight of those videos. We are at the second one now, but there are gonna be more to come so that you can get incremental in a kind of experience with AsyncIO each time with a particular important piece of it. So this time around, we'll focus on the fundamental construct of AsyncIO, the event loop. We'll learn how to use it without coroutines this time, how to configure it, and how the various implementations of the event loop differ from each other. Yes, there's more than one. We'll even look under the hood at the implementation to make sure we find the actual loop within and understand how it works. Casual users of AsyncIO rarely go into such detail. We're gonna go pretty deep today, but we're careful learners, we are not in a hurry, and we know that this knowledge will save us from some heartbreaking debugging sessions in the future. So let's dig in. Again, the plan for this particular talk is going to be to recap what an event loop is from the last video, to uh, see how the event loop works from the perspective of a end user, right? So if you just want to code, if you're just interested in how the API looks like, you're uh, in the right place now. We're also going to talk about differences between reactors and proactors, the fundamental two designs for event loops and uh, IO multiplexing. In fact, AsyncIO supports multiple implementations of event loops, so we're going to go and see how they are different. Finally, we're going to see how to configure uh, event loops in AsyncIO. There's quite a few toggles that we can pull and push. And we're going to look under the hood so that you are able to look at the very code of which AsyncIO is consisting and see that there is no magic. There are no secret handshakes. You can really understand how all of those things connect together. The last point I wanted to make, so let's just do it right now, is that if you are running AsyncIO in production, there is one particular implementation of the event loop that you really should be using, and that's UV loop. So we're going to talk for a while uh, about why. If there is a single most important picture in this video, that's the picture. That's a very high level diagram of what an event loop is doing. It's calling callbacks in some order, one by one. So how does this look like in AsyncIO? To get an event loop, let's start B Python is very nice. It's gonna kind of help me to make a very nice, attractive video for you. You just get the event loop, right? Uh, there is a function on AsyncIO that lets us do this. And then you can run it forever. You have to believe me that this is what is happening already. It is running forever. It did not return. So B Python was unable to show us the prompt again. There is, in fact, now continued uh, looping through the event loop. This is kind of uh, boring because there's nothing registered on it. So let's stop this and see how else we can run the event loop. For now, we can, for example, run until complete. For example, let's just sleep for five seconds so that it runs for a while and then it will release control again back to uh, the REPL to be Python. So you can run the event loop by just saying run forever or you can give it something to run and say, run until this particular thing is complete. So um, that's still not very interesting, right? Because nothing is happening on the loop. So let's create a function that will just print the current date time for us. Like, you know, this kind of thing, like literally print date time now. 
and we can schedule it. Let's just schedule it twice so that you can see that, you know, there are many things that we can schedule at the same time. And when we finally run the event loop that way, you're going to see that, you know, even though we're waiting for five seconds, soon is pretty soon, right after starting the loop, the two callbacks that we registered were in fact called. So that's how you schedule things to be called. Um, now, I would like you to introduce, um, I would like to introduce to you trampolines, which are a very special construct, but they're pretty actually simple. So they are um, callbacks that do something and then register themselves back on the loop. So see, that's the entire trick. They are going to do something and then they're going to call themselves later again. So if you run a trampoline just once, we're going to call the loop stop later. Um, we can now run forever and see there are incrementally many calls to our one trampoline. Why? Well, because the trampoline registered itself again on the event loop. So the event loop has something to run pretty often. Uh, instead of saying call later 05 trampoline name, we could say call soon, but I didn't want to flood uh, bpython with just the dates right here. So trampolines are very useful. So remember this trick, we will need it in the future. The awesome thing about trampolines is that we can run more than one trampoline in the same event loop. So here, uh, let's just create a trampoline with the name first, uh, a trampoline with the name second, and for good measure, a trampoline with the name third. So you can see there are three now. And if we call later, like call a uh, loop stop, just so that we are not in fact running forever, after calling run forever, we're going to see all those three trampolines nicely interleave, but they're scheduling uh, the next step after each other. So they still maintain ordering, which is pretty cool. In fact, so trampolines, pretty awesome. They can do something uh, like cooperative multitasking that way. This is kind of a spoiler for the next episode, but you can see where this is going right now. So, however, as we said before, the event loop can only ever run one thing at a time, just one callback at a time. So suppose we create a hog function that does a lot of Python level computation, which takes a while to complete. My computer, this is going to take a, at least a couple of seconds. So now we schedule the function, let's say, um, you know, like right now, or maybe let's schedule it like 15 seconds from now, right? So at first something else is going to happen. So now uh, we also want to schedule loop stop so that we don't run forever. And when we run forever, you're going to see that there's nice um, coroutines, well, coroutines, trampolines. But finally, after second 11th, nothing is happening for quite a while. And after second 17, it resumed, and now the loop is stopped. So what happened? Well, the hog function kicked in and clogged the event loop until it was done. So you might have noticed that this time we didn't have to schedule the trampolines again when we ran them now. Since they scheduled themselves on the loop, they were already there, and we are reusing that same loop object. That teaches us an important thing. An event loop can be started and stopped many times over. Just remember that stopping it too, for too long will open network connections that can time out. So that's the event loop in a nutshell. It never does more than one thing at a time. And if that one thing is slow, it will slow everything down. So we avoid doing very long operations at any given moment. We are doing something as fast as possible and then yielding um, our Mm, execution to something else. We are never waiting actively. We're always trying to make sure that we're just um, doing our work in the smallest uh, chunks possible. So the callbacks that we are scheduling should also be rather short. So if the event loop never does more than one thing at a time, but it can deal with many things at the same time, how does it do it? Well, by using a selector syscall. There's many kinds of selectors these days, but the first one that established this pattern was called select. Select allows us to provide a list of file descriptors that we want to read uh, from or write to. 
Naturally, those file descriptors can either be regular files, but also network sockets, uh, Unix sockets, as well as pipes. So when we call select uh, with such a list, as soon as any of the file descriptors are ready to either be read from or written to, the call modifies the list of descriptors to only leave those which are ready. So you're getting a list of things that you know there, um, there's something interesting happening with those. So there's also a timeout. So even if nothing is ready, we can still unblock after a while to do something else. For example, to react to user interface events. So this kind of multiplexing pattern is called a reactor. It is reacting because the user code reacts to notifications about file descriptors ready for reading or writing. And then the user code actually performs the reads and writes. So that's on the part of the user code in the user application. Fun fact, the twisted framework calls its event loop the reactor. So that's why. There's another approach to the same problem called IOCP for short, spearheaded by Microsoft and used in Windows. A single IO completion port allows a pool of threads to block on it, waiting for new events. So when an event arrives on that port, it wakes up just one thread to handle it. If there are many events, each thread gets a different one. So that allows us to use multiple CPU cores automatically. If there are more events than available, um, than available threads, some events will wait until one of the threads in the pool frees up. So in other words, IOCP is like a multi-threaded variant of select with built-in uh, built orchestration. This kind of multiplexing pattern is called a pro-actor because IOCP internally initiates asynchronous reads and writes. So the operating system does them for you. And those are performed internally there, and the user code is notified about IO operations when they complete, hence the IO completion ports. This approach is extremely performant. So which ones can we use in async IO? Well, on Windows, we can both use ProActor and Selector. On Unixes, we can use the Selector one, which does not mean you're gonna use uh, literally the Select syscall, uh, where we can use multiple implementations of those. But all of this is organized in quite a few files. So if you're interested in uh, learning how AsyncIO is built, you're going to be maybe a little surprised that there's quite a few files that you need to look in. So going from top to bottom here, uh, we have the abstract event loop first. So that describes the interface of what an event loop should be with no implementation yet. Then you get the base event loop with the base implementation of the event loop mechanics. So you have uh, something like, you know, um, the actual while loop, like it's there, right? But there is no multiplexer yet. There is no selector yet there. So then you have the base selector event loop. And in the base selector, you already have socket support, right? So given that there is some selector, you can already uh, decide that, oh, having this, we can implement TCP, UDP, TLS. Uh, so those implementations are already there. Uh, also, just raw file descriptor support is already implemented in the base selector event loop. Moving on, on Windows, you uh, have the selector event loop um, that scales not very well, in fact, right? Uh, it supports up to 512 sockets, and the sockets are the only file descriptors that you can actually use. So there are no pipes, there are no subprocesses there. The ProActor event loop scales much better. As I said before, uh, the multiplexing uh, uses uh, I.O. that happens on the kernel level, on the operating system level. So that lets it be really fast. And there is no uh, limitation of 512 uh, sockets at the same time. The ProActor's uh, event loop supports sockets and subprocesses, but it does not support arbitrary file descriptors. So none of those support Unix sockets and Unix signals. So that's Windows. On Unix, you only have a selector event loop. That's boring. Well, but that 
um, Eventube already does everything that we need. So it supports sockets, it supports file descriptors, it supports uh, sub processes, but to support them, it has a concept of child watchers and there's a bunch of them. So the default one starts a thread per sub process, which is the most robust, um, but you can also use a fast child watcher. But this one can only be used if you're sure not to use the blocking sub process module in your program. And that also extends to the dependencies that you might be having. So that's why the default is the robust threaded uh, child watcher. But as I said, we don't necessarily um, get the select syscall as our selector. So what do we do get? Well, Python already will select the most performant selector for you depending on your operating system. So on BSD and macOS, you're likely to gonna get um, KQ. That's a single call that can both receive pending events and modify event filters. So just with this one call, that's more efficient than the traditional select. And handles can uh, be more than just file descriptors. They can also be child process state changes, very fine grained timers, signals, and more. So KQ, pretty good choice for BSD and Mac OS. On Linux, you're gonna get ePoll, which is edge triggered or level triggered event distribution. Also very performant, available from Linux 2544, so uh, for a rather long time. Like all Linuxes that you're gonna be running on should have this. Uh, on Solaris though, uh, you might only have DevPoll, which is still a pretty good, um, well, evolution of the poll and select uh, modes because it is um, faster in terms of big O, right? It um, is O to active file descriptors, which is faster than select, which is O of highest file descriptor and faster than poll. Paul um, being the AT&T system uh, V, system five equivalent of select which goes with O to number of file descriptors. So the reason why we are going into so much detail in which one is faster and whatnot is that this is literally your tightest loop in your program, right? Sometimes people are saying that, oh, premature optimization, don't optimize unless it's a very tight loop. So this loop, if you are using AsyncIO, is going to be your tightest loop of your entire program. So it really makes sense to ensure that there are a lot of performance gains from your particular platform. You wanna use the most advanced event loop available for you at any given point. So those are the different selector event loops. So sometimes you might get one, but actually you wanted another for some particular purpose. Maybe uh, you want to be able to audit the events that happen. Maybe uh, some particular behavior of the other syscall interests you. So can you change the implementation and decide to set a different selector than the one that is uh, selected by default for you? Yes, you can. Um, this is the um, AsyncIO documentation right there. And you see that even though a Python will choose the most performance selector available on your operating system, if for some reason you have a strong preference, you can change it. In this example from the documentation, uh, and you can see like this yellow line on set event loop to loop, you can create a selector event loop with a specified selector. In this case, you, we really want, you know, the OG select syscall and then set the event loop manually. You don't have to set an event loop manually in most cases, except for one important special case. Python creates a default event loop only in the main thread. So if you're starting a Python program and you say get event loop, you're gonna get one. But if you're starting new threads, secondary threads or so-called worker threads, for those, um, if you'd like to use a separate thread specific event loop, you will have to set it manually. Why is that? Well, this is not done automatically for you to save you from a very common gotcha. In your code, if that code written to work on the regular main single threaded Python process, if you suddenly started running it in a different thread and that created its own event loop automatically kind of behind your back, 
you would end up with two event loops, but one isn't even running. Remember, you have to call run forever or run until complete. And you probably wouldn't do that for the secondary thread one if you never knew about it. Um, but even worse yet, even if you kind of did with some clumsy debugging, that one would probably be misconfigured. It would have a different configuration from the main one and it would not see events that happen on the other one. So there would be many problems with that approach. So that bug is kind of hard to find and attempt to fix it, you know, with just um, maybe running that event loop on the start of thread or whatever else. Like that, that never ends well. So Python defaults to the safe thing which is not to create an event loop for you on worker or secondary threads by default. Uh, if you really want this, which is fair enough, uh, you should create that yourself. So coming back to our uh, diagram, this is the class hierarchy of event loops in Python. Right? Again, the abstract event loop describes the interface, no implementation, but the base event loop includes the actual while loop. So are you ready to see it? Like, because I am, I always like to show this to people because that already makes AsyncIO more familiar. Look at it. There's literally a while true loop in run forever. If you're trying it out on your own now, you'll probably notice that your run forever is a bit more complex than this one. Like so I cheated a bit and what you're looking at in this video is how the function looked like in Python 3.5. That was before asynchronous generators, before automatic handling of the current running event loop. So if you look in Python 3.8, there's gonna be a bit more code, but those elements would make it a bit harder to see what is happening here. So instead I chose to show you the 3.5 one because I find it beautiful. Like it's powerful, but it's crazy simple. There is literally a while true loop that just calls run once, unless it is stopping, then it breaks out. That's essentially it. Of course, the heart of the matter is hidden in the run once method. So you want to see that? Well, let's see what that does. That's run once from what will become Python 3.8.3. So I'm done with cheating. This is the latest and greatest version. Well, it doesn't fit on the slide, but don't worry about understanding each line here. Let's just read the doc string first. So this is a single iteration of the event loop, right? It first calls all currently ready callbacks, pulls for IO using the currently chosen selector or proactor. It schedules the resulting callbacks for the next iteration of the event loop. And finally, for it looks at whether some of the call later callbacks are ready. So that's essentially it. So let's try again. Like those are four main things that happen. Calling the currently ready callbacks, pulling for IO with the current selector or proactor, scheduling the resulting callbacks for the next iteration of the loop, and looking whether any of the call later callbacks that we registered are already um, ready to be called. So I need some advice from you right now. By the way, would you rather see me use the light color scheme next time or, um, you know, do you prefer the dark colored one, right? Like with the uh, actual black background. Well, I use the um, white one in the console because for conference talks, I usually prefer to have a white background because it creates more contrast on a real screen, you know, with a real projector. But for videos, it might actually be better to use a dark background, I don't know. So let me know in the comments section um, if you'd rather see me use this color scheme or this one. This one is actually the one I'm using when I'm coding day to day. So I feel very at home in it. So you decide. But moving on, again, we are in the run once function that does four things. The most interesting part to me is where we use the selector, you know? So where is the most important thing there. So let's see. Scrolling a few lines down in that same function, you'll see that on line 1854, 
we run the select method on the current selector. That selector comes from the selectors module. So that is a uniform API over the many possible implementations of selectors that you might be dealing with. So that's the heart of hearts of iSyncIO. Let's take a short moment to appreciate this wonder. Cool. Now, some details are again hidden from us through the aptly named process event method, right? Process events. So what does that look like? Can we also click through and see how that's implemented? Of course, let's do it. Fortunately, this is also short. We are going through the event list and by doing so, add callbacks for the new file reads and writes and remove callbacks from canceled reads and writes. That's it makes sense but all of this so far was just networking the selector selects ready file descriptors the process events method well it just adds and remove callbacks but who actually calls the callbacks where does that happen if we scroll just a few lines down again you will see that in the same run once function we finally get to go through the list of ready callbacks and we run them so if our event loop is in debug mode if you see this if self debug asyncio even times the execution of the callbacks for us to warn us about slow functions hogging the event loop remember our example so it can do this. Wow, that's crazy. Like, can we actually configure our event loop to fix or at least make it easier for us to see the hog example doing bad stuff to us without printing anything? So we didn't ever see the hog function in the output, remember? Well, let's try that. Actually, this, the debug thing is something that we can toggle. So if we now go ahead and uh, decide to set debug to true as easy as that and you can just flip this on an event loop that was already created no problem and again call a hog a later 15 seconds later and call our loop stop another 20 seconds later we can run forever and see what's going to happen again first second third stuff is happening everything is crazy but suddenly it comes, it grinds to a halt. But as soon as it resumed, you see that there is some warning that we received from AsyncIO. And that was actually from the logging module. So if you would be actually logging to any file or syslog or any other means that you configured through logging, that would be visible. You would not lose that situation. But we now lost it because the prints were too many. So let's just look at this message again. Looking at this message, you will see it says executing timer handle hog at some line and file created at some other line and file and it took six and a half seconds look how detailed this log message is it tells you where your function is defined it tells you where it was scheduled on the event loop and how long it took to execute so that is very detailed for debugging. That is awesome. So I know I should be hiding this information from you until the last episode, which talks about debugging, but set debug is seriously cool. So you should be using it all the time when developing. Now in Python 3.7, if you're saying dash uppercase X while starting your Python interpreter, you will get a debug uh, set on your event loops by default. So that finds many silly and sometimes not so silly problems in your code. You should be using that all the time, except when you're running in production. Well, if it's a staging platform, then you, we, we might have this discussion later offline. But if you're running production production, you should be running UV loop. What is UV loop? Well, um, it is based on libuv. And libuv is a library written in C that powers Node.js. It is extremely performant and also does this magic of selecting the fastest method to run regarding you know, your particular operating system that you're on right now. 
So it also is able to do some magic with pro actors that even go beyond what AsyncIO is able to do directly with the Python level uh, loops. So LibUV, pretty cool. So now Yuri Salivanov actually used Cython to wrap this library and provide it with an AsyncIO um, compatible API. Remember that abstract event loop? It tells us exactly what things AsyncIO expects from an event loop implementation. That was a deliberate design. So plugging this in, now you're able to use UV loop for your particular code. But you might be asking me, well, if UV loop is so much better, then why does Python ship with some other event loops? There are many answers to this, but the most important thing is that the event loops that you're getting in Python, in ACKIO already, they are plenty fast for most um, kind of low scale uh, deployments. But before you get to deployment, there's plenty of things you need to develop your program. And having a reference implementation that some random dude can use in his video to show to you that here is the while true loop. This is how this thing works. And then we can click through and read sentences that almost read like English to explain how all of this connects together is tremendously useful. It is also useful when you're running code on it because if things are surprising every now and again on something that is an asynchronous event loop, you can also just PDB, breakpoint, stop your program and step through it and really see what is happening. So that reference implementation is important for uh, teaching, for correctness, for being a reference implementation. So others like UVLoop can actually use them and compare behavior. So we will always have that particular implementation there in Python. And it is already pretty fast, especially on Windows if you're using the default proactor loop. Again, IO is happening on the kernel level. So that event loop is pretty good uh, at the start. So you pip installed UV loop. Did anything change? Not yet. What you need to do is, well, first, yes, let's pip install UV loop. Um, the latest version at the time of making that video was 014. And as soon as you have it, you need to only import it and say UV loop install. And at this point, when you are getting an event loop from AsyncIO, the one you're going to get is in fact going to be the UV loop loop. Um, so that's everything that you need to do. Just remember to call UV loop install before you get event loop. Right? Because if the event loop is already set up for you, you would need to exchange it to the UV loop one. Um, so that is something very important to call UV loop install quickly. So that's pretty much it for today's episode. Today we focused on the event loop to show you that it really is nothing magical. It is literally a loop which handles network events and execute, uh, executes callbacks one by one, as the picture shows. So it can handle many network events concurrently using a selector or proactor and can handle many callbacks concurrently, even though it can only execute one callback at a time. You need to really internalize this. This is why I'm telling you this so many times. Some callbacks schedule themselves again on the event loop, which is a trick called a trampoline. I'm sure we're going to see it again. So now, if you felt like we went quite low level here and making big programs like this using call soon and come later doesn't seem very natural, your gut feeling is absolutely correct. Instead of using call soon and call later directly, AsyncIO programs are written using coroutines. And those are defined in async functions. So when we are going through our videos, fortunately, the very next episode is about that. So if you now feel like, ah, maybe this async IO thing is not really for me, just wait for it. Just wait for that one episode. Uh, coroutines make asynchronous programming really natural. So the reason why we went through the event loop now is so that the coroutines will feel natural, but they won't feel magical. We will understand how they're implemented as well. So pretty much this is where we are. 
end of slideshow, end of episode. What I would like you to invite you to do now is, first of all, give me that feedback on whether a light background is better for us or a black background is better for us. Like, I'm pretty sure that, you know, even though public speaking requires light backgrounds, here it's not quite clear. You might be looking at the screen, you know, in a room that is not very well lit. So I don't really know like how you are watching, how you're consuming those videos. So let me know. And the second thing I would like you to do is, hey, there are uh, episodes that are coming in the future. And some of them say very little so far, like batteries included. So let me know what kind of application you would really like to write. What is kind of brewing in your mind when you're thinking of AsyncIO? I might be able to help you when working on the batteries included episode, as well as the example web application that I already have in my plan. But again, if you tell me exactly what you're looking for, I might be able to um, introduce something specifically to answer your question, to answer your need here. So subscribe to, let, uh, to be let know about the next episode. Thanks again for watching. See you next time.